morning. Welcome to the Free North Church. Welcome to worship, church family. Welcome to church. Hello. Good morning. And a special welcome if this is your first time joining us at the Free North Church in Inverness. Whoever you are, wherever you are in the world, whether you're here for in-person worship in the church or joining us over the internet, may God show us his favor, his love, and his grace. We're here to gather in the name of Jesus and to worship the living God. Our call to worship is the word of God in Psalm 46, and that psalm assures us of the solid basis of our faith. We can speak together these words. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. The Lord Almighty is with us. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Amen. Mighty and gracious God, as we come together today, may our praise, may our worship, may every part of it be pleasing to you. Show us how you are our refuge, our strength, our rock. And please be with us for the glory of your name. Amen. To praise God together, we're going to sing with melody in our hearts the words of New Scottish hymns as they take up Psalm 139, Were I to cross from land to land. Cross from land to land and sail afar by sea. Descend the depths or climb the heights, my Lord remains with me. Before the blood ran in these veins, the days ordained for me. Where it's in your book, O oh Lord, before I came to. come to the Lord with our prayers. Lord, we have been thinking about you as our refuge, as our strength, and we need strength as we come to you. Strengthen our hope, our heart, our faith as we come to you now in Jesus' name. 
We want to be a praying church, a praying fellowship of believers, and we need your help if that is to be the case. We think of the early church that was banned from preaching in the name of Jesus, and yet with boldness they kept preaching, and they did so because they kept praying to you. And you caused the room where the church gathered to shake as your Spirit came in power upon your people. You gave them boldness. Please give us boldness to pray and boldness to speak as witnesses for our Savior. We ask that your power will be at work to meet us in our various needs. Please meet those who are suffering and those who are sick with your grace and, and your kindness. Please meet those who are spiritually in need and who are looking for you and for answers. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray for our community, for leaders in the community, for other churches, for local schools, for the health service and those who work in it. We pray for those who are at risk of suicide in our community, remembering that there have been many groups and clusters of uh, folk who have taken their lives or attempted to do so, for those who are in despair and for those families bereaved in that way, we pray your help and your deliverance. Lord, we ask your protection from the evil one, the enemy of our souls, from Satan. We pray for the nations at this time of turmoil for various reasons. We ask for the United States in a time when there is polarization in that society. May there be a peaceful election and we ask for a God-honoring outcome. And we pray where there has been tension or rioting, where there has been violence, that you would turn these things around to your glory. Lord, we want to remember our colleague Roddy Rankin today and pray for his strengthening and healing. We pray for members of our church family who've been unwell or in hospital or who are about to go into hospital. Remember Helen, we do pray, and grant her strength and a calm heart and grant her protection and healing. And we pray the same for Fiona and for Julie after their recent times in hospital. Lord, have mercy. And we ask for any others who may be unwell or worried that your hand of protection will be over them. Father, we remember our sister congregations today in Uri and Muir of Ord, the ministry of Gordon Martin. And we pray that in both the town of Muir of Ord and in the surrounding villages and in the rural areas round about, that that church and its people will be a warm and winsome light. Will you help them with online and then with in-person meetings and encourage them? We pray for John Johnston and all the congregation in Kirkcaldy. And we remember all your people in Fife and in Tayside as they work together. We thank you that the folk in Kirkcaldy have known some new families come among them. Please increase that congregation. They're praying for five new families to join them in the next few months and years. And we ask that you will answer that and go far beyond that prayer request. We ask too that as they have been sharing the gospel in a shared Christianity explored with some other free church congregations in Tayside, that you would add a new life and conversions to all these churches and bless their partnership. Lord, will you give health and strength to all ministers of the gospel, those whom we've just prayed for, and all in our city and all around the nation who are serving you by seeking to make Jesus known whether in highland villages or in towns of 50,000 plus like Kirkcaldy, we ask that there will be a harvest for you. And we pray now that harvest for Inverness and for the work of this congregation. Remember Milburn School and other high schools in our community, the staff and the pupils, and we pray for them. And we pray now for an end to the effects of the coronavirus, and we ask that this virus will not continue to damage the work and witness of gospel churches up and down this land. 
Give us grace, we pray. Now, Lord, help us as a church family as we pray together the prayer our Saviour taught us to pray, praying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to now uh, come to a delightful task, and that is to commission our new woman's pastoral worker, Carrie Marlowe, for the work that she has been called to do. So I'll invite Mary Macaulay and Carrie to join me at the front of the church. Carrie, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the Free North. We've been looking forward to your arrival and it's been quite a long time since plans were first discussed about having a women's pastoral worker for the Free North congregation. In God's providence, it's now early in Angus's ministry that you've been appointed and that you've arrived, and we're delighted to have you here. We're very conscious that you're arriving in the middle of a pandemic, and it's always a wee bit of a challenge to move to a new place, but particularly so when uh, there are some restrictions in place. And it's our prayer that over the next while you will settle in really quickly, that you will establish relationships really quickly, even though it's a bit of a challenge when you can't visit other people in their homes. And we would love to be able to welcome you into our homes, but that's going to have to wait for a little while. And we just pray that God will be with you in this new role and um, be assured that our prayers and our support will be with you. So, thank you very much, Mary. That was lovely. And uh, we want to all echo that welcome to you, Carrie. We'd like to invite the ladies and gentlemen who are present in church to stand while we have a prayer of uh, commissioning and of commitment for you. And I'm going to ask you some questions. And I'm also going to ask the congregation to vocalise their support. And their bulletin will tell them what to say and when to say it. So, let's... Uh, formally invite you to accept God's call to come and be woman's pastoral worker for this church family here in Inverness. So I've got a few things to ask you and I'll stick my specs on so I don't get it wrong. Carrie, God has called you to serve him as the woman's pastoral worker in this congregation. Your task is to share the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ by encouraging and blessing women of all ages to grow and mature in their faith, helping them to glorify God as they live for him and as they disciple and win others for Jesus. May our loving God fill you with wisdom, strength, and grace to serve him in this task. Will you please show that you accept God's call on your life by answering these questions? So I'll ask those questions and then I'll invite you to respond. Who is your Lord and Saviour? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Saviour. Will you be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ as you share his word and demonstrate his love and shepherding care to others? I will, with God's help. Do you accept the responsibility to work among the women of this church and city? And will you seek to draw others closer to Jesus by your life and ministry? I will, with God's help. And now to the congregation gathered here, I ask you to stand. And perhaps those listening at home will also speak the response as it appears on the screen from your homes. 
congregation of God's people? Do you, God's people in the Free North Church family, support the call of God to carry, to serve the precious woman of our church and city? We do. <coughs> now, I would ask the congregation here present in the building to stand and to give their commitment to carry and those listening and participating at home, please, will you also respond? And so we can speak together our words of commitment to her. Here is the question for the congregation. Do you, God's people in the Free North Church family, support the call of God to carry, to serve the precious woman of our church and city? We do. Do you promise to pray for her faithfully, and do you promise to support and encourage her in her work? We do. We'll ask God to bless Carrie. Father, we thank you for the way you lead us in this life. We are often uh, like sheep without a shepherd, and yet Jesus Christ is our pastor in every moment and in every step of the journey. So it's our prayer that you would reassure Carrie that you are with her today and that you are going ahead of her and that you are the Lord, her shepherd, even as you call her to be a pastor, a shepherd of others, especially the woman of all ages in our church family and in our surrounding communities. We ask that your shepherding care will extend into the lives of individuals and families and that you will use Carrie and give her joy and give her spiritual life and fruit and strength for all the tasks that are ahead. Lord, help us and come close to us through Jesus our Lord. And reach out your hand now to bless our sister and to give her your face, your smile. Amen. I can just leave you with the words of Psalm 121, carry to encourage you in the days to come. The psalmist writes, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Amen. Now, having shared Psalm 121 with Carrie, we're going to sing that psalm from the Scottish Psalter. The Loch Broom singers will uh, teach us what probably will be a new tune for some of us, the tune Elijah, as we sing together Psalm 121, I to the hills will lift mine eyes. I to the hills will lift my eyes from west of my day. My city cometh from the Lord, who heaven and earth hath made. Thy food. Oh,
for some weeks now on Sunday mornings, we've been learning from the book of Titus, one of the short New Testament letters written by Paul. This one was written to Titus, a gospel minister in the island of Crete. And one of our members, Effie Finlay, is going to read for us from Titus chapter 3 and from verse 8. Titus chapter 3 from verse 8. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things that, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. As soon as I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nico Nicopolis, because I have decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you very much, Effie, for reading that part of God's Word to us this morning. Well, we're turning to that last section of the book of Titus, from Titus 3, verses 8 to 15, for the message today. The title for the message is Living the Life of Grace. Living the Life of Grace. Verse 8, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Well, I had a really nice uh, experience last Wednesday morning. I was invited to join the chaplaincy team at Milburn Academy and uh, to meet one of the first year classes there. It was really great. I was a bit worried before I went into the school because we had a double period, two 50-minute periods back to back, and I wondered if I would have anything interesting to say or if the children, the young adults in that class, would be switched off and bored on a, an early Wednesday morning. But actually, it was lovely. Uh, the teachers and the pupils gave me a good welcome and a bit of a grilling. They asked lots of really interesting questions. They asked particularly about the future. They asked a great deal about heaven, about hell, about the resurrection, about what the Christian faith had to say about some of these great questions. And it encourages me that perhaps there are many people in our city, young people and not so young, who may be open to hear the answers that Christ and the Christian faith have to offer. If you are searching for answers, you could do much worse than to read the Word of God and the Scriptures. And that's why we turn Sunday by Sunday to Bible passages like the book of Titus, to listen to Jesus and his followers, to the apostles and the prophets as they speak about the way of God and about the way of salvation. The letter to Titus is 21 centuries old, but people then and people now are asking the same kinds of questions. What's important about life? What values matter? How do we care for one another and our world? How do we make a difference in this life and in the next? 
if there is a life to come. It's easy to get distracted by trouble or by pain. It's easy to get divided from each other. Within the church, that can happen. And so, the words of Paul to Titus and the words that Titus was to share with the church in Crete can be so relevant and helpful to us as we live for God in the 21st century that we are living in. Paul is very concerned about Christian living, Christian behavior, Christian standards, the way we treat outsiders, and the way we treat our brothers and sisters in the Christian family. Do we show Jesus in our relationships, in our attitudes, or are we grumpy and selfish people? We were thinking last time about that wonderful grace of God that has appeared and the impact of God's salvation, the impact of God's kindness and mercy and love upon us. Well, today I want us to think in particular about how the salvation of God's grace, the salvation of God's kindness, how it changes the way we live. A few things to learn from the closing verses of Titus. The first one is pretty brief. Don't let quarrels divert you from grace. Don't let quarrels divert you from grace. Just looking at verse 9, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. The letter to Titus in my Bible just takes up just a little bit less than two pages. It's really short. It's really punchy. Paul doesn't waste words. He wrote similarly to the Apostle Timothy. He wrote two letters to Timothy about how to organize and structure the church and leadership in the church. Well, Timothy got seven pages in my Bible. So these are not long letters but they focus in on core things, on important things, things that should matter to us. And Titus chapter 3 does not run out of steam. It's got something relevant and powerful to say right to the end. When I was young, uh, we used to sometimes see in the shops uh, sticks of rock and uh, wherever you went on holiday, each uh, holiday town would have their own rock. Even the town where I grew up, Stornoway, you could buy Stornoway Rock from, from Woolworth's store, and the name of the town was inside the sweet, inside the candy. Uh, Blackpool, famously, Blackpool Rock, you know, the kind of thing. Scottish towns had that as well. If you were going to break the letters of Paul and look for a word that ran through them, surely it would be the word grace. Paul is always teaching the church about living in response to God's love and living by God's grace. Grace is God's love in action towards us, and it creates a response of love. So, straightening out the church in Crete will involve God's message of grace transforming us. The last word in this letter is, grace be with you all. And in verse 9, he says, right, there are troubling people in the island of Crete. Some of them are destroying the, the harmony of the church. They're quarrelsome people. Some of them are cranky people. They've got a hobby horse. They, they keep going on about the, the things that they care about that are not really important. Many of them were Jewish cranks, Jewish controversialists, obsessed with the, the law and with archaic, weird genealogies and um, speculation. What happened to Enoch? What happened to this person or that person who hardly gets a mention in the Old Testament? Fables and myths and legends. And they would split from other people who didn't agree with them. In this letter, in verse 10, we find the word warn a divisive person once, then warn them a second time, then have nothing to do with them. 
And that divisive word, warn a divisive person, the word in, in the Greek language is, is, is the word heresy. Now, the word heresy has a history, and in later centuries, it takes on the whole meaning of dangerous false teaching, something that attacks the Christian faith is, is a heresy. A heretic holds a, a dangerously false set of beliefs. That's not what the word meant when Paul used it. That's what the word came to mean, and that's how we use it in our own time, heresy. But the original meaning of the word heresy is just to do with an attitude. And it's an argumentative attitude. It's a, an argumentative, divisive attitude. I've got to get the last word. I've got to get my way. And sometimes I've been in a room with people, and we've been discussing something, and I've even tried to agree with somebody who had a strong opinion. And they'll say, but no, no, you don't agree with me. You're not saying what I'm saying. Because they're determined to disagree, determined to fall out. That's such an unchristian attitude. It's so unhelpful. So if you find it in your heart, if you find it in a group of, say, leaders in the church who are trying to deal with a problem, if you find it in your business life, if you find it in your wider family, Paul says, don't let these quarrels or quarrelsome people make you forget grace. Don't let them divert you from God's grace. Avoid foolish stuff and foolish talk. If you're going to have an argument, have it in a godly, gracious way. At the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, there's a free church minister in Edinburgh called Alexander White. He wrote uh, books that are still published and widely read today. And he spoke ab about uh, when Christians disagree in this way. Alexander White said, if we cannot disagree with clean and all loving hearts, we love all people, then let us leave all debate and all contention to stronger and better people than we are. If you don't know how to argue in a Christian way, don't argue. If you don't know how to disagree in a Christian, in a godly way, don't disagree. Just button it. Just zip it. If every time you disagree and argue, you're straining relationships, breaking relationships, well, you're harming the gospel. Don't let quarrels divert you from grace. That's number one today. But number two, verses 10 and 11, is to set limits on your patience. Yes, we want to be gracious. Yes, we want to be loving. Yes, we want to be uh, grace-filled when we disagree. But there are limits. There are Bible, biblical limits to patience. So, again, verse 10, warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. You should show grace to people. Even if they're a bit cranky or a bit grumpy, there may be a reason for that. They might not be well, or they may have a history that has hurt them or damaged them in some kind of way. So try to be gracious. Try to teach a better way to agree or to agree to disagree with someone who has that outlook on life. But if it persists, if somebody is always picking a fight or always managing to divide a, a committee or a room full of Christians, you've got to stand up to that person and challenge that pattern of behavior. And if there's no learning, and if there's no changing, and if there's no repenting, there will come a point where you have to draw a line and say, this behavior is dangerous or damaging, and it must stop. Warn a divisive person once, 
warn them a second time, and then exercise appropriate discipline. Have nothing to do with them. It might involve church discipline. It might involve the church agreeing to, to censure someone. Or it might simply be that you prudently avoid someone and avoid using them, say, in a leadership role. Are we afraid sometimes to shut down an argument? Well, we should care about peace. And if we've heard every opinion and we've heard it two or three times and we're not getting forward, sometimes we just have to draw a line and say, well, we've heard everyone, we need a decision, and then we move forward and we agree to support that decision, whether I get my way or whether you get your way, as long as we have a decision that is God-honoring and it's not going against Scripture, we get on with it. And maybe you had the right argument, but you lost. And time might show that. But what we can't do is be stuck always uh, attacking each other or whatever. We've got to move forward. And that sometimes means that if there's false teaching or divisiveness or bad behavior, that you just deal with it and you move on. Brothers and sisters in the Free North Church, pray for your elders and deacons. Pray for your pastors. Pray for the church planters over in the Mark Inch. Pray that we would be clear about the things the Bible is clear about. Pray that we would be courageous and bold leaders and that we would raise up successors and another generation of leaders who will teach the gospel faithfully and who will be clear, and when they have to, who will stand up to bad behavior or to wrong things and draw a line under it because we want the gospel to go forward. So don't let quarrels di divert you from grace. Set biblical limits on your patience. And the third and the last thing this morning is win the world by doing good. Win this world. Reach out to the men and women of this world and do it by lives that are doing good. In verse 8, this is a trustworthy saying. I've been telling you a trustworthy saying, Titus. I've been telling you about God's grace and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. I've been telling you about that grace that appeared. Now, I want you to make sure that you get the church devoted to that message of grace so that they do what is excellent and profitable. Avoid the foolish stuff. Avoid the divisive stuff. We're going to build a team, Titus. We're going to have a team in Crete. And we're going to strengthen each other. And we're going to do that wherever we start churches. So that at the end of the day, verse 14, people will learn to devote themselves to doing. Doing what? Doing what's good. In order to, pro to provide for urgent needs and not to live unproductive lives. And we send you our greetings and we send you our love and the faith. Greet the church in our name. Grace be with you all. Win the world by doing good in the world. These concluding uh, verses in Titus chapter 3, they seem to me to be speaking to two audiences. Uh, Paul is speaking to Titus, first of all. And he says, Titus... You do some good with your life. Titus, do some good. You're the leader. You're the pastor. Set an example in the way you live as well as in the way you teach. Titus, go and do some good and teach others, the elders and the other pastors, to do the same, to do some good. Teach the people to be careful to devote themselves to doing what's good. Verse 8. Verse 14, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what's good. If you carefully read through the letter to Titus, and if you get your highlighter out and you underline every time Paul talks about doing good, this is the ninth and the tenth times in this short letter that we read about lives that do good. Do good for God's glory and do good for other people. The logic of liberalism is 
Try and be a good person. Try and do good deeds. And that's the way you're a Christian. The logic of gospel churches is God has been good to you. God has forgiven you. God has saved you. And therefore, go and do good. It's not that you do good in order to get into God's family or God's favor, but that because you're in God's family, you go and do what's good. Now, you've been hearing the gospel from many preachers, from many pastors for many years, for probably most of you for many decades. And you know, hearing the gospel, sometimes, sometimes it's a bit like sitting on a plane when the, the voice comes over and gives you the safety briefing, and the stewards or the stewardesses, they stand in the, in the aisle, they stand in the cabin, and they show you how to put on a mask. They show you how to put on a, a, a safety vest so that if, if the, the plane comes down on water, you won't sink. And they take out the safety card, and they show you the brace position and all of these things to do in an emergency. I don't think most of us miss a safety briefing like that the first time we hear it. We're, we're acutely aware planes can have accidents, planes can crash, and the first time you fly, you listen to the safety briefing. But if you're fortunate enough to fly a lot, the second, the third, the fourth time you fly, you're blasé about it, and you don't really listen. You're looking at your magazine, you're looking at your electronic devices instead of paying attention to the safety briefing. Be careful when you hear the gospel, and the gospel says, this is how you get right with God, and this is how good, good deeds flow from being right with God. Be careful that you don't tune out and miss the gospel. The gospel is not go away and be a goody two-shoes. The gospel is you are a sinner. Jesus is a savior for sinners. Go to Jesus, and as Jesus saves you, he will change you, and he will show you how to lead a, lead, lead a good life. That's how the gospel works. Titus, go and do some good. And then to the men and women in the church, he gets the application to them to be a team doing good. So, church, church, do some good. But don't just do some good, church. Do some good together. Do some good on mission together. Do some good as a team. That's why Titus is in Crete. And in verse 12, Paul says, I, as soon as I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, I need you back for my team. I'll send people to Crete, and I want to see you again, Titus, because we've got to work together. I've decided to spend the winter in Nicopolis. Do everything you can to help Zenas, the lawyer. He's got a role to play in the church and among God's people. And do everything you can to help Apollos to go on their way and go on their mission. See to it that they have everything they need. Raise the funds, raise the prayer support, raise the help. Ministry's not just going to happen. The church isn't just going to be here next week and next year without people coming together as a team, committed to each other, committed to the same message, the same gospel, and committed so that they give time, and committed so that they give, yes, financial resources too. We've just appointed a woman's pastoral worker. We could only do that because God's people faithfully give. What a brilliant thing to have a church staff. We have church planters in the Mark Inch. What a brilliant thing to support planting. We support mission partners. Well, without your commitment and mine, it'll all stop. Without your commitment and mine, there'll be no church planting, there'll be no global mission, there'll be no free north, there'll be no local churches. We'll not be reaching this city. 
but we won't manage on our own. I won't manage. You won't manage. We need to be the family, the church, the people of God. If we come together, there'll be training. If we come together, there'll be resources. If we come together, there'll be a degree of safety and accountability and networking and fellowship and support. If we don't come together, I'll achieve less. You'll achieve less. We need Zenos, and we need Apollos, and we need Titus, and we need Paul, and we need Chris Davidson, and we need Carrie. That's the way the church works. And you get no hint that Paul thinks that these people are going to be competing for glory or competing for the limelight or anything like that. They're just doing what followers of Jesus do, devoting their lives to him. Verse 14, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what's good in order to provide for urgent needs. He means provide for gospel workers' urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. There are necessities. There are literally necessary needs that these gospel workers will have. And as we come together, we support gospel workers prayerfully and practically, and we invest ourselves in the service of the gospel and in the service of each other. Brothers and sisters, when you have opportunity, as opportunity arises to serve, please serve. When there are ministries restarting after COVID, please get behind these ministries and get involved in them. There will be ministries we can do even during this season of a mini lockdown. There may be new ministries. Please get involved. I hope in a few weeks that we'll be welcoming some new members into the church fellowship. And that should be something that causes us to rejoice. What can you do? Well, you can be loyal to one another. You can love each other and pray for each other. If you're fit and well and able to come to gatherings, turn up and do your part in the life and in the ministry of the church in prayer, in witness, in evangelism. If you're doing church online, well, turn up at church online. Don't say, well, church is happening at 11 or church is happening at 6, but I don't need to be there. It's not important that I'm there. I can catch up tomorrow or Tuesday. That probably won't happen. If the church is meeting, even if it's online that it's meeting, be there, bring your family, bring your friends. We're living with tough rules and regulations just now about what we can and cannot do with friends. But even within those regulations, you can go to Starbucks and do a Bible study with a friend. You can go for a walk with a friend. You can have someone in your garden. Find ways to serve, to encourage, to bless. Get together on the sofa with your family and talk about the sermon. Have family worship. These unremarkable things are the things that will make church life remarkable in the island of Crete. And they are the things that will make church life remarkable here in Inverness. Do life in such a way that Jesus will get the glory. And as chapter 2 and verse 5 says, we don't want God's word to be miscalled or maligned. We want our lives to be so different because of God's grace that people are not saying, look at these people, they know how to squabble. Look at these people, they know how to disagree. But no, they will look at us and say, look at these people, they know how to live a good and a God-centered and a Christ-centered life. My life is short, so is yours. Our time is short. It'll be over soon. Remember the word of the Lord through the, the preacher, through e Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10 says this, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, 
Is there something God is placing in your hand to do? To pray, to give, to encourage, to turn up. Whatever you find in your hand to do, do it with all your might. Father in heaven, we commit the church family to you. We particularly commit Carrie to you today, giving thanks for her, but each and every member of this church family. And we ask that we may find things to do that will bring you honor and glory this week. Help us to encourage each other, even if it's just in the act of turning up that we encourage others. And we pray for those whose uh, circumstances mean that they are mainly worshiping online. Help us as an online church family to care for each other, to reach out to each other, to pray for each other, to be in touch with each other, and whatever we find in our hand to do, to do it with all our mind. Bless us and be with us this week and use us as a church. Amen. Very few announcements today. Can, can I remind you that our evening church tonight is at the earlier time of six o'clock. Do join us for online worship. Uh, we have Sundays at six from now on, from this Sunday, evening service, six o'clock. And as this Wednesday is the first Wednesday of the month, our prayer time, our prayer gathering will be online on the Zoom platform this Wednesday at 7.30. I hope to see many of you there as we share together in the fellowship of prayer. And now to conclude our worship, we offer our final song to the Lord, Show Us Christ. Where else can we
God's blessing. May grace and mercy and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and with all God's people everywhere. Amen.